This week on Vaticano, we travel to the Italian city of Narni to discover how this town inspired the writer C.S. Lewis. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. There's a place on earth where reality meets the imagination. The world of fairy tales. Where waters flow from mountains, mighty streams twist and turn, and then fall into millions of silver droplets only to send a heavenly mist into the air. If a fantasy world were to exist, it would be here in the narrow river valley by the blue, fresh waters and the lush green forest. Above the valley, on top of the hill, lies the city of Narni. For a thousand years, it went by another name. Narnia. Yes, C.S. Lewis's Narnia indeed does exist, and it's not in England but in Umbria, central Italy. In this episode, we'll tell you the story of Narni, a city that lies between fantasy and reality. Our story begins one hour away in Rome, in the light of the Christmas season. In the Holy Cross University Library, we met with Father John Walk, professor of English literature. Between the books, we find the Chronicles of Narnia, written by C.S. Lewis, and Father begins his story. C.S. Lewis's book, The Chronicles of Narnia, particularly the very first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, is one of the, one of the greatest Christmas stories ever written because what you find there is the very first thing that the, the Pevensey kids discover when they enter into Narnia is a world without Christmas, a world where Christmas has been abolished for the last hundred years by the White Witch. It's a, it's a winter without Christmas. And part of the story, an essential part of the story, is the return of Christmas to Narnia. So it's a perfect story for the Christmas season. C.S. Lewis is one of the greatest apologists of the 20th century. He converted to Christianity as an adult man at the age of 33. And with the Chronicles of Narnia, he wanted to introduce Christ to children through fairy tales. There's no Christ, properly speaking, in, in the world of Narnia. It's an alternative reality, and yet they do have the Feast of Christmas. It's one of these kind of paradoxes in the, in the story. But I think it's also uh, symbolic. I mean, the, the presence or absence of Christmas signifies a world with or without Christ. and the world that the kids encounter, that alternative reality, is a world where Christ is absent. So a world without Christmas is a world without Christ. Who would be Jesus Christ in an imaginary world like Narnia? This question guided C.S. Lewis in writing the Chronicles. Aslan is uh, the, you know, a lion, but the Lion of Judah is also a symbol of Christ, of the Savior. In the story, he sacrifices his life for traitorous child, Edmund uh, Pevensey, and saves you know, the world from the power of the White Witch. So he's a symbol of Christ, the Savior who dies for the sinner. C.S. Lewis very clearly represented the battle between good and evil through the Lion Aslan and the White Witch Jadis. He created the imaginary world of Narnia to help the reader to interpret the signs of good and evil and to apply that understanding in the real world. Narnia is an alternative world, an imaginary magical world, but it's actually in its name from a real Italian city called Narni, but in Latin it was Narnia, and C.S. Lewis as a young boy was reading a, a, an atlas, a Latin uh, atlas, and discovered this place in Italy. It's actually the geographic center of the country of Italy. 
And he just loved the name. He thought it was a beautiful name, Narnia in Latin. And he used it when he, went, when he got around much later in his life to writing the, the Chronicles. Besides the sweet sounding name, what are the other links with the Italian city of Narnia that writer Lewis mentioned in the Chronicles? Perhaps the Narnians themselves can answer this question. Wandering through the medieval lanes, we meet an expert of this Italian city. I am the engineer Giuseppe Fortunati. I am the honorary president of the Vivi Nani Association. I have been working for many years on Nani's story and ancient Roman Narnia. We asked Mr. Fortunati if C.S. Lewis had ever visited Narnia, or perhaps Italy. C.S. Lewis never went to Narni, almost like the Italian writer Salgari, that wrote about a city without really knowing it. Despite this fact, Giuseppe has important clues that testify to the connection between this city and the Chronicles of Narnia. But first, he tells us the story of the town. Narni is called Narnia. Nani was named Narnia 2,099 years ago. The Romans conquered this city during that time period, formerly known as Equinum, and it was an Umbrian population living there, which was later subjected to it by conquering it 2,000 years ago, and from that period on took the name Narnia. Today, only the bridge of Augustus, built in 27 BC, remains as a testament to the Roman period of the city. This area was an important conquest for the Romans as it held a strategic geographical position. The city lays in the middle of the Flaminian Way, which links Rome with the Adriatic Sea. The bridge carries this road over the Nera River. Once, these ruins were a grand marble bridge, 30 meters high and 160 meters long. Narnia. Narnia is derived from the word Nar, which means water that flows. So basically the city of Narni takes its name from the flowing water. This is also why C.S. Lewis chooses the name. The water is the source of life. For centuries, the springs of the Nera River gave its living waters to the city. These blue waters are a reminder of the wood between the worlds, a mysterious realm described by C.S. Lewis in the book, The Magician's Nephew, one of the seven that make up the Chronicles of Narnia. In the story, one of the ways to get into Narnia was to jump into one of the pools. This magical color, the result of the high level of copper elements in the water, gives the Nera River this particular blue color. Upstream in the Nera River, there is another incredible place that testifies to the connection between water and Narnia, the Marmore Falls. In the description of the last battle of Narnia, C.S. Lewis says, there are blue lakes and tons of water every second, flashing like diamonds in some places, and dark glassy green in others. Many poets, such as Virgil, Marcus Tullius Cicero, and Lord Byron, wrote about the beauty of these waterfalls. Sun shining through the silver drops and green forests creates this natural spectacle. although the falls were artificially built by ancient Romans in 271 BC. The Marmory Falls are the highest human-made waterfalls in the world. The complex is 165 meters, that's 551 feet tall. The main reason for building these cascades was to dry up the river marshes that were provoking malaria during the ancient times, and today, the water helps the people in a different way, by giving electricity. 
These channels are part of a hydroelectric power plant, Galeto. There are even more links between the city and the chronicles. We followed Giuseppe to meet the mascot of the city, the lion. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. At the entrance to the museum's hall, a big lion welcomes visitors with a smile. The lion we see now is a symbol of our city because it was found approximately in 1930 during an excavation work on a road. In that context was found this lion, which is clearly from the Roman era. If we give a close look to the character of this lion, the outside language shows a lion, like the good lion Aslan from the Chronicle of Narnia. C.S. Lewis describes Aslan as the great lion, creator of Narnia. He's not safe, but infinitely good. Aslan is the only character presented throughout the entire story. The Lion of the Chronicles of Narnia, as you know, is Aslan. Aslan is a Turkish name that identifies the lion. And so this aspect is also played by the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. Many cultures have used the lion as a symbol of power. As Giuseppe explains, it had a special significance for the Romans. It should also be noted that in Roman history, the lion was always near the emperor. Where there was a camp and there was the emperor, beside the emperor's tent, there was always a lion. Therefore, the lion figure was taken by the Christian religion and by the lion of Judah and so on. Also, the lion is the symbol that represents the churches, which was put inside the emperor Celeste, the emperor of God, and so related later to this aspect. In the first and second books, the enemy of Narnians was the white witch, Jadis. Giuseppe claims that he can show us her castle here in Narni. This is the castle of Narnia, the castle of the White Witch of the Witch Jadis, which transforms everything into ice, which is basically the symbol of evil in the Chronicles of Narnia. During the years of Jadis' reign, the celebration of Christmas was banned and the winter lasted for a hundred years. This castle is also a symbol of an evil time for the people. It marks the Avignon Papacy, a period of confusion and disagreement in the church and in European politics. During this period, the Pope moved to Avignon, France, and anti-popes ruled the church. The castle we see behind our shoulders is called the fortress of Cardinal Albanos, because it was erected in 1371 by Cardinal Albanos to bring the Pope back from his captivity in Avignon and to create at the same time a curtain of defense to Rome for the new pontifical state. It has a double value, a historical value, and an important value in the collective imagination towards the castle of Narnia. Below the castle, on the Flaminia Way, there's more proof of the similarities between the city and the wonder world of Narnia. Allora, qui ci troviamo sulla Via Flaminia. We are on the Via Flaminia, the ancient Via Consolari dei Romani, that we can compare to the stone table of the Chronicles of Narnia. 
This area is also a pre-Roman sacrificial area because it was used before the Romans as a sacrificial area where presumably they did animal sacrifices. It could also have been human sacrifices as well, but basically this area here can be compared to the stone table where Aslan, the good lion of the Chronicles of Narnia, died and then resurrected. The stone table is the place where Aslan defeated the White Witch once and for all. This part, described by C.S. Lewis in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, has the most Christian meaning. The ancient law of Narnia states, all traitors belong to the White Witch. And as Edmund betrayed his brother and sisters, Jadis held him prisoner. So in turn, Aslan proposed to sacrifice himself at the stone table to redeem Edmund. Jadis accepted, but without being aware of the ancient inscription on the table that states, if a willing victim that has committed no treachery is killed in a traitor's stead, the stone table will crack and even death itself would turn backwards. As you can see here, for example, there is the whole area of blood flowing of that time. This stone table also had an important significance for the ancient pre-Roman population of Narni. The altar is faced up towards the Nera Valley, to the river that gave life to the city. Ancient aristocratic priests of the pre-Roman divinities themselves made also human sacrifices in the area dominating the whole Black River Valley. As you already know, this area below here is the area of the Nar River. The old Nar gave the name to the town of Narnia. Nar means the flowing water, and that means the source of life and therefore the source of the resurrection. In other words, this allegory series here represented can bring us back to the Chronicles of Narnia. The question remains, are these resemblances, the castle, the stone table, the blue waters, and the lion, merely coincidences? In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. The symbol of the city of Nani has always been the griffin. The griffin is actually half lion and half eagle. And so here in the municipal palace, you see that there are all the series of related images of this griffin. In Narnia, a lot of fantastic animals live on the walls. Griffins, dragons, and lions. What we see in this square is also indicated in the Narnia script that is reported on all the stones of the city. The town hall was built in the Middle Ages in 1273. While the griffin guards the entrance to the town hall, we walk with Giuseppe into the cellar where he sheds light on the medieval Narnian traditions. Narnia also has his medieval festival. We invite everyone to come on the first Sunday of May. There are 15 days on this date before and after La Città di Narni returns back to the Middle Ages. So you can see beautiful medieval costumes, characters and osterias where they resume life and other places as it was during the ancient medieval splendor. And they basically become part of the party in May, bearing the name of the Ring Race. This feast takes its roots from honoring the 4th century Bishop of Narni, San Giovinale. After the processions and religious ceremonies, Narnians open the season of traditional equestrian games. 
Initially, the race to the ring was reserved only for the Knights of Narnia. Today, it's become a national sport. Two horsemen with lances race in opposite directions with the goal of knocking off the rings. This event makes for a grand spectacle. Narnia is a magical city that has so many facets. Basically here in this city, we have a stratification from the Narnia Romana, medieval Narnia, and from Narnia to our day. Narnia has an elegant medieval appearance thanks to the Middle Age period when the city reached its heyday. This 14th century fountain decorates the square in front of the city cathedral, dedicated to Bishop Saint Giovanale. Narnia is surrounded by its city walls that are still partially preserved. The fortified gate, called Terniana, together with the east wall of the city, made this corner an impregnable fortress in medieval times. This medieval appearance of the city recalls the representation of Ker Perivel, the castle of kings and queens of Narnia. Perhaps the creators of the last screen version of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe also were inspired by this Umbrian Italian city. There are many visual similarities between the two. Both places are located on a hill by a river, the bridge and city wall have similar shapes, and they're positioned in nearly identical locations. The placement of the cathedral in real life and the palace in the Chronicles are also similar. There are even more links between the city and the Chronicles. Giuseppe has his own theory that reveals the answer to us. How did C.S. Lewis describe the city without physically being here? C.S. Lewis was a professor from Oxford who knew the ancient Roman history very well. Ancient Roman history from Tacitus, Pliny the Elder, Pliny the Younger, Titus, Livius, and all the great Latin writers wrote about the city of Narni authors that he read since he was young and that he mentioned several times. Whether Lewis read about Narnia, or Narnia is only the fruit of the author's imagination, there's another witness, Blessed Lucy of Narnia. La Beata Lucia può essere paragonata alla Lucy delle cronache di Narnia. Blessed Lucia can be compared to Lucy from the Chronicles of Narnia. Blessed Lucia is a Narnese saint who lived around the year 1500. Basically, there is an imaginary linking with this saint to the city of Narnia. Even in the icons where she is depicted, there is always written, Blessed Lucia of Narnia, just to strengthen this bond with both the fantastic Narnia, but also with our real Narnia. Blessed Lucia is a blessed person who has an important history because she also receives stigmata, and that is why there are many writings that testify that she is one of the few women to receive the stigma. Did Lewis know about Blessed Lucy of Narni? And did he base the main character of Lucy Pevensi on an Italian blessed? We must also say that Walter Hooper, one of C.S. Lewis's most respected biographers, truly is able to compare the life of Blessed Lucia to the life of Lucy from the Chronicles of Narnia. Visiting Narni, Mr. Hooper said that after many years of studying C.S. Lewis's writings, he thinks that the author chose the name intentionally, and that Blessed Lucy of Narnia furnished for the world one of the most beloved and spiritually mature characters in English fiction. As C.S. Lewis used to say, the signs which you have learned here will not look at all as you expect them to look when you meet them there. That's why it's so important to know them by heart and pay no attention to appearances. We wish to our viewers to be attentive to the Christmas signs, since Jesus, King of Kings, was born on earth.
Merry Christmas. Thanks for watching. Thank you.